Welcome. In this module, I'd like to introduce you to wicked sustainability problems. What are they and how can we learn to cope with them? First, to help understand wickedness, I'd like to um, pose some random almost questions that have to do with sustainability. Are GMO foods inevitable to feed the world, for instance? Um, are solar panels sustainable? Is organic sustainable? Are vegetables grown in cities healthy? Is soy milk healthier than cow milk? These are all questions that do not have universal answers that work everywhere, all the time. In fact, they are controversial these answers because people, different interest groups will have different answers to them. So they're also highly political. Um, working on sustainability issues in some ways um, requires that we look for solutions in a context and that we recognize that what we might think is sustainable today may turn out to be unsustainable tomorrow. So sustainability, uh, addressing complex sustainability issues related to food security, biodiversity loss, climate change, inevitably will require engaging people who have different understandings, different mindsets, different values in a meaningful way without that conflict becoming uh, a, a, a blockage for learning. must at the same time recognize that we do live in an age where information is, is uh, everywhere and we can, through our technologies and our digital um, technologies in particular, um, we can find quick answers, but to really have a deep understanding and to dive into these issues in a meaningful way that is relevant um, to our everyday lives is quite hard. And as E.O. Wilson says, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. And we need wisdom to deal with these wicked problems. So, real, in a nutshell, we're living in a time where there's lots of complexity and uncertainty. There's also ambiguity, knowledge is contested. Um, there's lots of hyper-connectivity with quick relationships, quick answers, but not a lot of in-depth understanding or deep relationships. And there's also dominant, what we might call neoliberal forces, emphasizing particular values, material values, consumer values, at the expense of maybe other values like solidarity, community, um, and uh, engagement. And we do need uh, to learn continuously because many of these issues that we talk about uh, change all the time as the world turns. These characteristics cannot be an excuse to ignore these issues because they are too important to ignore. So they are urgent and we must respond to them. Now, let me quickly go to simple complex and wicked issues. This is from Rob Gibson and he has a, a neat way of, of, of describing these three categories of problems. I won't get into the simple and into the complex. Uh, you can read the slide behind me when you have time and you can go back to, his, uh, to the source. But the problem and the solution to problems like climate change, they cannot be understood easily. They keep shifting. As soon as we think we've found a way to address them, something will have changed and shifted in the equation which makes us rethink everything. They are ambiguous, they are chaotic, um, many elements are hidden or unknown, there are no right or wrong answers and it's hard to quantify uh, these kinds of problems and to measure them. Um, in fact, um, um, it may do more harm than good than trying to measure these kinds of problems. And if we develop indicators for change, they must be flexible indicators as the problem um, transfers or transforms in time. Of course, there is a lot of discourse in environmental, um, um, you could call it environmental discourse, where there are more ecocentric ways of looking at these issues and there are more anthropocentric ways of looking at these issues. Some emphasizing equality between people, others kind of not so much stressing that, but rather uh, promoting a more 
self-centered, individualistic approach, uh, a more maybe competitive approach towards finding um, solutions to these kinds of problems. There's no agreed upon way of addressing these kinds of sustainability issues. What is interesting to note is that there's different possibilities for engaging people in these kinds of issues from rather low levels of input where we rely a lot of on science and technology and policy to rather high levels of input where we rely on empowerment and agency and autonomy of people coming up with their own solutions in where, where, where they are bearing in mind the unique situation of their neighborhood, their community, their school. Goals can be set in advance and prescribed or they can be set jointly in a co-creative process. You could say that when we have in the upper left side of this quadrant, it could be called expert-driven sustainability. In the lower right, you might say, it could be called people-driven sustainability. When there are simple problems and there's clarity about, about what is, needs to be done, what is unsustainable and what might be solutions, you could say there are simple problems and we could more easily, with more confidence, prescribe how people should behave, what they should do. But as we move to the lower right, we move to the wicked side of the equation where we do not have these clear answers and where things may shift in time then participation, interaction, co-creation becomes more important. Example of the upper left might be having a blue flag for clean beaches and harbors where you have criteria and they need to be followed and met and then you get to wave the green flag or labeling of foods. Experts determine what the criteria are or ISO 14001. If you move to the right, organizing an organic food festival in town involving multiple stakeholders. You have a particular goal in mind, but you do require some interaction if you want to do it well. Eco-schools, similar, there are some criteria, but the schools have a lot of possibilities to also self-determine involving students, uh, teachers and community members in what their eco-school might look like. So there is space for input. And in the lower right, if you look at, for instance, urban agriculture or the greening, in this case, the greening of Detroit, where you have lots of parties involved in trying to find a way to, to have some ecological restoration of abandoned lots and lands in the city and trying to create a more livable, healthier um, uh, space that also produces uh, not only vegetables but also social cohesion and, and cultural understanding. Looking at this again, same cross, slightly different language. You could say on the upper left it's a more instrumental approach to dealing with problems and the lower right it's more emancipatory. And you can see that the roles of the educator or the facilitator shifts from an instructor to a facilitator of co-learning. The people involved from passive receivers to the more active and empowered receivers on the lower, rest, on the lower right. The knowledge and understanding from the upper left universal, more or less the same in Kampala, Uganda, as it is in Wageningen. Certainly this is true uh, for, for, say, waste recycling, or uh, if you want to look at science teaching Newton's laws or photosynthesis, taught in this more or less similar way uh, in, in all parts of the world. But if you look for uh, creating a, a more sustainable uh, neighborhood, or having urban agriculture, it will be different in Dar es Salaam as it will be from Detroit. It's very contextual. The motivation in the upper left tends to be more external, and in the lower right it's more intern, so internal, intrinsic, as it's really affecting people's everyday communities and lives. So we also have a different kind of uh, role of knowledge in these, in these kinds of programs, from knowledge transfer, and where the, the education is more about transmission and training in the lower right it is knowledge creation where it's more about interaction and meaning making in another module we already talked about sustainabilities and you could say that these kinds of abilities um, correspond in a way with 
the interactive, more open, co-creative process that you need to address uh, the wicked problems. Have to do with understanding sustainability in a local context, critical thinking about these issues, disruptive thinking, breaking with stubborn routines maybe, but also looking at change and innovation, being entrepreneurial, connecting different people, building social capital and relations so that diversity can be used, and finally reflecting on the values that are underneath the normative dimension. So you could say that the nature of sustainability challenges um, are representing, uh, that represent global systemic dysfunction, you might call it, is such that they cannot be addressed by conventional teaching or problem solving and behavior change strategies. The inevitable ill structuredness and ill definedness of these issues and the high levels of complexity and, and uncertainty and ambiguity, as well as the political and ethical ladenness that affect these issues um, require new kinds of competencies, new forms of learning, social learning, transformative learning, collaborative learning, place-based learning, and engagement in experiments, niche experiments, where people learn, they try new things out, they reflect on them, and try to improve the situation rather than solving the situation. It involves the co-creation of knowledge, negotiation of meaning, of values, and finally it inevitably will need the disrupting of unsustainable routines and systems. Asking questions like why, what change do we want? What is keeping us from changing? What is keeping things the same? And how can we begin to disrupt those forces and powers? that want us to stay where we are. But also, how can we utilize the forces and powers that also want to push towards a transition of doing things better rather than just doing better things?